Professor Vladimir Vapnik earned his master's degree in mathematics in 1958 at Uzbek State University in Samarkand, USSR. From 1961 to 1990, he worked at the Institute of Control Sciences in Moscow, where he became head of the computer science research department. He then joined AT&T Bell Laboratories in Holmdale, New Jersey, and was appointed professor of computer science and statistics at Royal Holloway in 1995. Professor Vapnik was taught in has taught and researched in computer science and theoretical and applied statistics for over 30 years. He has published six monographs and over 100 research papers. His major achievements have included the development of a general theory of minimizing the expected risk using empirical data and a new type of learning machine called the support vector machine, which poses a high level of generalization ability. These techniques have been used to solve many pattern recognition and regression estimation problems and have been applied to the problems of dependency estimation, forecasting, and constructing intelligent machines. His current research is presented in his latest books, Statistical Learning Theory and the Nature of Statistical Learning Theory. Professor Vapnik was also one of the invited speakers at the colloquium, The Importance of Being Learnable, hosted by the Computer Learning Research Center at Royal Holloway in September 1998. Uh, so I always tell my students that uh, Professor Vapnik is the father of machine learning. So today, Vladimir will speak about rethinking statistical learning theory, learning using statistical invariance. Please join me in welcoming him now. Thank you, Anna. And thank everybody who come to listen to me. So the subject of my talk, rethinking of statistical learning theory. About 40 years ago, Professor Chervanenkis and me developed so-called VC theory of learning. This theory reflected existing understanding of philosophy, what is learning about. Uh, we understand that learning is about to estimate rule which minimizes probability of error. And we developed this theory. It was a pretty good theory because it's it based on necessary and sufficient conditions. We have a bound, we have a theorem which comes from, from this theory. We have structural risk minimization. And it looks like we did everything. And since this time, conceptually, Learning theory did not develop so much. People still continue to look uh, that on, on the rules which minimize ex expected risk. But how they do it, exactly like we did before, they minimizing empirical loss. Now I understood that it is two primitive point of view. And today I will introduce you different theory. So from my point of view, it's more deep theory. And I will show that when you using old theory, you is not able to extract all information which contains in your training data. And there are mechanisms how to extract this information from training data. And I will try to show you these mechanisms. From this point of view, big data is very funny problem. It's artificial problem. You don't need big data. You need smart way to analyze data. And that is, will be subject of my talk. OK, let me start. So I have two messages in my talk. The first message comes from Japanese proverb, which says that better than 1,000 days of diligent studies is one day with a great teacher. And the question is, why? What teachers doing? For my recollection, my teachers, my great teachers, did not do something special. It looks like they did something trivial, whatever I can read in books. But it is not so. I will show you that things which we thinking like trivial can contain a lot of information and we, we, we need it to, to use it in machine learning. And second message comes from Wigner's paper. Wigner's a great physicist. 
uh, winner of Nobel Prize. And he wrote in the 60s article called Unreasonable, uh, Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematical in Natural Science, where he claims that mathematical structures knowing something about reality. The physicists, when they developing theory, they, don't, they, they often don't looking on nature. They looking on equation and trying to understand them. And the same we will do in our machine learning business. In this talk, I will show you teacher-student interaction that, use, that can be used by the intelligent machine to, to do learning process. But first, I would like to start with philosophical remark. So every problem of natural science contained three elements. First element, setting of the problem, which gives mathematical understanding of the problem. And this is the basis of everything. The second, resolution of the problem. The idea how you will solve this problem. It, and the third element is proofs, which must show that your resolution achieves the goal. So, in my talk, <coughs> I will try to convince you that the very first point, the setting of the problem, in classical machine learning is, was too primitive. I will introduce another setting of the problem, which is different from classical one. But before that, let me describe the general scheme, which is true in any case what machine learning people do. There exists a nature, and it is pure facts, which generates randomly and independently Situation X, there exists object, uh, and on the input on the ob this object coming vectors X, and object return is it with uh, value Y. And it is important that object does this with respect to some conditional probability measure. What is that? It not necessarily return every time on x, y. It can do that, but it is not necessary. It just flip a coin, and that gives you y. And then exists learning machine. So what is learning machine? It is very general definition. Any learning machine contains set of functions. And goal of learning machine to pick up one function from the set. So machine observed training data, x1, y1, xl, yl, and then it should pick up one function to solve learning problem. But what is learning problem? The old understanding, which is imitation of the object, and it came from philosophical instrumentalism approach. In philosophy of science, there exist two approaches. One approach philosophers call instrumentalism. They declare that goal of science is to predict events, to predict something. It does not matter uh, the law of nature. They would like to predict what's happened. And the second approach, called philosophical realism, they believe that goal of science to capture law of nature, to understand what is God's law for, for, for the nature. So the first approach, Imitation, it was what we're doing now, in all, without any ex exception of learning machine. Our goal is to try to pick up decision rule, which will give you zero or one, and that this rule should be such that minimize the functional which is in the middle of uh, this sheet of, of uh, slide. Uh, what is that? Theta is zero one function, and f is some real function. So why I will, for simplicity, consider two class classification problem. The same for regressions, the same for multi class classification. But for simplicity, it is two class. Y can be zero or y can be one. So what doing now for two class classification problem? 
we try to find so decision rule which gives you zero one which provides the smallest possible probability of error. That was absolute goal for old approach. I will change this approach. I would like to switch from imitation, from instrumentalism approach to philosophical realism approach. I would like to understand what is in the nature, what is conditional probability in this box. How this guy object operate? So my goal will be the last formula on the bottom of this slide. I would like to have a function which close to the conditional probability function, probability of one given x. If I know probability of one given x, probability of zero given x is just one minus probability of one given x. So probability of one given x is some function. I would like to pick up in the set of function some function which is close in, in, in this sense. That is my goal. And I will show that because I changed the goal of learning, uh, I will change whole theory. So if I have a goal, suppose I know conditional probability function, then path recognition for two class classification problem is trivial. Say one is conditional if probability of one given x exceed 0.5 and say zero otherwise. Because it can be zero or one, if probability more higher than 0.5, say one. So the construct decision rule, if you know conditional probability is easy. The problem is to find conditional probability. But before, let me give you some idea about old approach. What was old approach? Given data, x1, y1, xl, yl, which is chosen from uh, probability measure by x, y. Yeah. OK. Uh, find the function that minimizes probability of different answer with y. And the method for solving that it is to minimize empirical loss, to find the rule which gives the smallest amount of error on your training data. And then you try to say that I will pick up this rule, and this rule probably will be good for, 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 for future for test data. And the this is your answer to the question. When this principle uh, works, when you can use empirical loss minimization instead of expected loss minimization, how well this minimum describes a real existing minimum, uh, and what is the bound? And is there exists better way than minimizing empirical risk? So we have structural risk minimization, and it's shown that you cannot beat this. So this is what this is theory about. But we would like to estimate conditional probability function. If you will look in the textbook of what is conditional probability, so the definition of conditional probability is the following. Conditional probability, P, uh, probability of y equals, say, 1 given x, it is ratio of two densities function. Density of P y given x, comma x, joint density, over P of x. And that is conditional probability. But what is density? Uh, we will discuss this, it is important. The density is derivative from cumulative distribution function. The, the basic concept of statistics is cumulative distribution function. That's how people de describe randomness. What is randomness if you have cumulative distribution function? Without this, you cannot talk about randomness. Uh, but then you, you take derivative from cumulative distribution function, you take ratio, and the ratio gives you conditional probability. It's too messy definition. And the same for regression. The last line describes regression. I will not 
talk about regression, but all formulas which I will show for two class pattern recognition will be the same for regression estimation. I will show on the next couple of slides, but and then let me start statistical inference problem. How it start? You remember Wigner's remark, go deep to math, and it contains answers. I don't like definition conditional probability. Let me do it in different way. Conditional probability is solution of the following integral equation. It looks like it's more difficult, it is integral equation, but I don't use density, I don't use the ratio of densities. Uh, this is true, even density does not exist, but this is my definition. In the next slide, I will show you that classical de definition comes exactly from this if you uh, have density function. It is trivial uh, fact comes from, from this general uh, expression. And regression function, it is second line. You can show that regression is the same. And theta is equal one if uh, u is larger than zero and uh, zero otherwise. It is uh, just step function. But then let us formulate our problem of inference. We would like to estimate conditional probability function, in another word, to solve the integral equation. If we don't know probability measure Px, Y, and Px, but we are given data. And again, two class pattern recognition is trivial uh, part, as you know, conditional probability function. So let me show that my definition of conditional probability coincides with this definition, this classical definition. The first line is my definition of conditional probability. Because uh, theta from x minus t is zero, if it's negative, I can rewrite like a second equation. And if I will take derivative from both sides, and if density exists, I will g uh, have exactly classical conditional probability. So let us forget about classical definition because it's too messy. Two things you should estimate before you will come to conditional probability. But just to try to solve integral equation. And the same for regression. I will not show you for regression, but it's just the same. And there exists <coughs> basic problem of statistic. The basic problem of statistic to estimate cumulative distribution function, the probability measure. You don't know, because if you know cumulative distribution function, you're solving your equation. I don't talking how you're solving, but formally you can solve it and you have conditional probability function. But you don't have cumulative distribution function. Instead, you have data. So, and that is only a heuristic which contains my talk. And that's what people in statistics doing all the time. They use, instead of cumulative distribution function, empirical cumulative distribution function. Some of theta, this is uh, step functions. You know, that is, uh, and, um, and there exists um, theorem, which calls grivenko contelli theorem, which says that uh, if you have a lot of data, cumulative distribution function will converge to to real distribution function and in strong metric, the, the biggest deviation will be called to, to zero. Uh, and, and there exists a bound. In 33, Kolmogorov proof exact equality for, for big data. When L is big, you have uh, this deviation which is like that. Uh, and then 40 years, from 50s to 90s and even less later, people try to find bounds for finite number of L. It is one dimensional case. And they have just first term of Kolmogorov equality. So for any L, it is this bound, this is pretty good bound, and uh, uh, you, you, you can estimate. 
but we will need multidimensional case. Uh, in the 70s, Professor Chervanyankis and me developed VC theory, developed VC dimension, and if you use VC dimension, you can get this bound for multidimensional case. It is uniform convergence in, um, in uh, high dimensional space. So now, when I equipped with my heuristic, when I can use, instead of cumulative distribution function, empirical cumulative distribution function, I can come back to my integral equation and rewrite it in, in, in approximation. I just will put, instead of unknown cumulative distribution function, the approximation, which is third line, the first line for conditional probability, second line for regression, and third line what means empirical estimate of cumulative distribution function. And when I will do that, I will do the last equation. So I, I, I have the sum, which I have to, 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 I have to solve this equation, which is approximate, because it depends now on data, on data, but approximate means that I will take left-hand side minus right-hand side, take the square, and will try to minimize over set of functions. And the same equation both for regression and for conditional probability. But for conditional probability, y takes two values, 0 or 1. And for regression, it takes any function you want. But let me come back a little bit and say that when you consider empirical distribution function. It is also in functional, which minimize loss, instead of real cumulative distribution function. You, you put empirical cumulative distribution function and, and, and will we'll have empirical loss. Okay. So, you have this equation, which is true for, for both for path recognition and for regression estimation. Now our problem is to solve this equation. But the best new, bad news about this equation is that it is ill post problem. It comes from Friedgold integral equation. And when you change a little bit right hand side, it can change a lot in your solution. So it's What I should do then? No? Okay. Yes, it is ill post problem. For, for ill post problem, there exists standard technique called regularization technique. It was introduced by Tikhonov, but what is this technique? You take difference or norm, square of norm, between left-hand side equation and right-hand side equation. Then you add a regularizer, and you solve this equation uh, in, in given set of functions. But regularizer, I, I don't want to talk about that. People in machine learning often use regularizer, but regularizer is special functional. You should read about that and use a real regularizer, not whatever you want. So, and there is this of theorem which says that if you will do everything correctly, you will get the solution. I don't want to go through that. And, uh, but in our case, it's something worse. Because we have not only a right-hand side, uh, which is approximately given, but also equation, operator given approximately. You have approximation both in left hand side and in the right hand side. So in late 70s, my student Stefan Yuk and me we proved that if you will use the same regularization technique, you will be successful. Now let us discuss what is regularization technique about, and we will use and we will do exactly what it requires. So we have to construct this functional which 
the first term gives difference be between uh, approximation of left-hand side and approximation of right-hand side plus regularizer. And we have three elements to, um, of functional to be specified. The first, what is the metric? So we will use the simplest metric, which is L2 metric. The second, which set of function we will use? We will use reproducing kernel Hilbert space. It is Hilbert space uh, equipped with special inner product, which is very powerful set of function, much more powerful than neural net. And, uh, and it is infinite dimensional, say, expansion of the set of function. It's very powerful set of function. And then we will use as regularizer norm of reproducing kernel Hilbert space. I will show you what is that. So this is a question which we would like to solve. It's written instead of real distribution function, empirical distribution function. This is functional. Then we, we checking what is distance between function. And we would like to have square loss. And that is the last line. You know, I understand that it is difficult to understand immediately. But if you would like to understand learning theory, I'm encouraging you to look this presentation again and again and look on the textbook and try to understand everything. I try to be very close to, to deep math. That you see that no fantasy, in whatever I, I will explain you. So let me give you this distance. I have two terms in square. I will do trivial things. I will uh, take square. I will have uh, square of one term plus two. No, well, it is normal. How to make it in square? Make an integral. And I will have this description of my function, which have uh, term v i j. I call it element of V matrix. I and J, it is uh, element, XI and XJ is element of training data. You will have L by L matrix, which is L is number of training data, so it is big matrix. And this is a surprise. Unexpectedly, we can describe the, 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 the you can describe this equation, rewrite this equation in the form of the first equation. And you will see that we have this empirical functional, which is completely different from classical experiment functional, least square method. It's something else. It is not least square method. And I got it a couple of years ago. And I try to understand what is physical meaning of V matrix, V i j. And I understood that something wrong in least square method. And let me explain what is wrong in least square method. You, you know that the difference between y and f x i alpha is called residual. So least square method says that your solution depends on the value of residuals only. But this solution says, not, it is not. The solution depends not only on residuals, but also on position of your training data. And I will show later that position of your training data capture a lot of information from data, which you, when you're using this square method, all algorithms on machine learning use this method, they can completely ignore. So if you would like to do better, don't use least square method. Use the matrix method, which take into account position of the vector. Let me give description. Uh, you see this x point and y, x and y for regression. And uh, residual is difference. It's shown in the middle, in, in, in three cases x1 and uh, delta 1, delta i, delta j. But 
you have position between every two points of observation. From point of view of least square method, if I will bring closer uh, this these vectors each to other, it will not change because the residuals does not change. But from this point of view, it will give you a different answer because you take into account how, how spread your data. And that is important. It is, uh, don't forget that it is L by L matrix. It contains L square uh, values. So it is very powerful information. And this is way how to, to, to estimate V matrix. It is very trivial. You can estimate it uh, in multiplicative form, in additive form. Yeah, I, I encourage you to read to understand this. But up to now, just keep in mind that it's easy to estimate from data. Nothing funny. Then I come to reproducing kernel Hilbert space. I don't want. So what, what is reproducing kernel Hilbert space? You know that every kernel can be expanded in uh, infinite term by Mercer theorem with, uh, with respect to orthonormal function. And if you have function which is expanded infinite, uh, with infinite term over uh, this basis, you will have some function in Hilbert space. And if you equip this inner product in special ways, you will have reproducing kernel Hilbert space. But what is great? So it is true for one-dimensional case and for multi-dimensional case. Uh, what is great in this theorem? That any expansion you can represent in, in the different form, in the form of sum over kernel. It is expansion of the set of function, but every time expansion is different because your value of kernel have a fixed x y for for different. It is not like in classical case, in classical case you have the same expansion for 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 all cases. It is every time different expansion, but nevertheless, instead of doing in uh, infinite parametric space you have fi finite parameters. And it is the only way how you can solve multidimensional problems in statistics. I don't know another way. We introduced this way in 62 in support vector machine. And since this time, it became very popular. But actually, it is, up to my knowledge, it is the only way how you treat multidimensional statistics. This is the properties of kernel sum of kernel is kernel. And this is very important kernels. Uh, say, I will talk about last two lines. This simple kernel, K0, uh, it is in spline with K equals 0. It describes all possible piecewise linear functions. So all neural networks can be described by using this kernel. But it is the most simple, most primitive kernel. In theory of approximation, the best approximation tool is splines of order three. And this is spline. If you would like to have a spline of order three, you just use this kernel. And you will have it. So our solution, yes, and, and our solution of integral equation, we can rewrite now in explicit form. So we have this distance. This is norm of our, the second line, the second formula is norm of our regularizer is is our regularizer, and the last is expression for uh, for functional which has to be minimized. So I will introduce vector notation because it's simple both for computing and for observations. So I will call parameters alpha i a vectors, y, which is from training data, like vector y vector of observations, k, x, y is k matrix, v, it is L by, by L dimensional case, v is also 
L-dimensional case, and K of X, it is vector of expansion. <coughs> In this notation, my function will have a form. It is A vector A multiplied on K expansion where A is minimum of functional in the middle of, uh, of this slide. So it has closed form solution. You don't need to use computer, it is just formula. And this is solution, so you can have your expression in the last line. This is actually SVM for L to norm. So let me compare, but this is better than SVM, because SVM take into account only residuals. It is least square matter. But now I use V matrix. So I take into account position of my points of observations. Not just separate my data, but I, I trying in algorithm to see position of my points. So, and let me compare classical algorithm, which, what we got. So the first line, that's what we got. And the second line is classical SVM algorithm. And we will compare that. But that is different. Difference, we use E matrix instead of V matrix. Identity matrix instead of V matrix. We ignore position between data. But what, what is the advantage of the matrix? Because you use integral equation, you take into account box where you trying to estimate conditional probability or regression function. When you're doing in classical way, you just estimating regression function, I will ask you where? In all space? But here you're describing this space. Because when you are writing uh, Fred Goldman integral equation, you, you, you must show how you integrate from A to B. Then you're taking position in, of observation inside this box. And also I will script goals of, because it takes time to explain, but it, it has something else. So what we did till now, we just improve classical instrument. What I talk to you to now, I just tell you that we can do better in, in direction which was in classical algorithms. We not just separate our data, but also take into account something and took more information from that. So we can do better. But it is still the same philosophy, the same direction. Now I'm switching to new philosophy. What is new philosophy? Suppose I have conditional probability function, it is first line. I can take integral over conditional probability function. Then on the right hand side, I will have probability of the first class. So I have training data. From my training data, I can estimate theoretical value of integral. You, you, you see formula star on the left-hand side. An empirical evidence of that. I can just count how many vectors of the first cl uh, class I have in my training data. And they must coincide. Because it is conditional probability. This is invariant. So, before I have some set of functions, now what I'm doing, I say I have this set of function, but I will exclude such function which does not keep this invariant. So my set of function became smaller. But now I have to minimize this functional subject to this constraint. And it has also closed form solution. Let me take another invariant. Suppose I will take vector x and I will take integral over vector of x. xs is s coordinate of vector s and it has d coordinates. 
then this integral equation left hand side express center of mass of vector x of the first class. It is theoretical uh, expectation of center of mass of vectors of first class. On the right hand side, I just take all vectors of first class and compute center of mass. And theoretical and experimental evidence must coincide. So before I start to solve problem, I can restrict my set of function, pushing them to keep invariance. Zero order invariance, it's called zero order the first. And first order invariance. But this is the most trivial. But now let me give you general form of invariance. I can take any function I want, psi of function. Take expectation on the left hand side of this function and compute this expectation on my training data. And then I can write theoretical evidence, experimental evidence, and I would say, OK, I would like to keep this invariance. And I can introduce as many invariants as I want. So, and that is what is new, what we did not use in classical machine learning approach. And I would like to say that that is the most important part of learning. I call function psi of x predicate and value of equation on the left hand side, it is star equation, and right hand side correspondingly theoretical and empirical evidence of predicates. And then method of statistical invariance requires then theoretical evidence should be supported by empirical evidence. And that is exactly how physics works. I, I will talk about a little bit later. And choice of predicate is intelligent part of the problem. But here I use the most trivial mathematical predicates. Okay. And that is closed for solution. If I have invariance, say d invariance, and I would like to estimate conditional probability, I will do the following. I will use VSVM. It is give me A. And then I do d corrections, as many corrections as I have invariance. And weights of this correction is solution of uh, linear algebraic equation. So everything in closed form. You can construct this function, which is any function from Hilbert space, which keeps invariant I want, and also separate my training data because I using I minimizing loss function. Let me give you example. Suppose teacher try to teach kids to recognize zero and recognize two. Teacher would say, okay, in middle of digit zero, you can see light spot. And what it means? It means that you can just make a sum of value of pixels in the center and then take expectation and that will be my function phi. Then I will take expectation, theoretical, it is the last line, and empirical, which I will measure on the training data. So, and the same for digit two. So, this dark tail or something like that. And let me give you illustration. So I have 12 curves. 
the first column just SVM, classical SVM with L2 norm. Second column is SVM, v, v SVM with V matrix. Third column, it is SVM with one invariant. And last column, uh, VSVM with two invariants. You see, have big difference from column to column. The blue curve is true conditional probability function. And black is approximation. And the first line is 48 uh, uh, training points. We specially did 16 for one class and 32 for another class. It is not equal. It, do, it, it does not matter. And we have all this stuff. Second for uh, 96 and last for 196. So let me give you a number. So say SVM, how close SVM, the first table, how close SVM to real conditional probability for 48, 30, 0.37, 0.32, 0.22, VSVM, almost twice better for all the stuff. SVM with invariant, it is twice better. And VSVM with, with invariants, you can see how, how close is that. But now let's talk about, about probability of error. The probability of error for SVM, the for 192.16, for VSVM 11, for the same. Then you can see it, 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 it is improved. Um, this is one dimensional case, but the same for multi dimensional case. That is problems. And I compare SVM with SVM and not VSVM, just SVM with. N plus one invariant, N is dimensionality. It is zero order invariant and first order. First order has as many uh, invariant as many dimensionality you have. So N plus one. So SVM for diabetes 30, no, 31 versus 22, bank 12 versus 10 and so on. So I did it for different size of training data. It is second table, 71, 151, 304, and 650. So you, you, you have 32, something about 30. It will go down, but it looks like it's saturated. See what does SVM with invariants? It goes down. And the same for magic. So invariant contain a lot of information. Okay, so we have our record for diabetes, which is 2273, with nine invariants. I would like to create invariants, new invariants, which is have non-zero weight in some of my invariants. To do that, I just looking, this is my training data in two-dimensional space. I just do for two-dimensional space. I. Uh, looking for data between these two lines and, and looking for zero order invariant. Just, just count how many elements of the first class I have between these two lines. And it should be the same as theoretically predicted. If it's not the same, I will keep it like invariant. So we looked in the data, tried to find area where we have contradiction between theory and experiment. And as soon as we have this contradiction, we try to do invariant to resolve this contradiction. We did it, adding new invariant, and we did it on half percent better. So probably we can find 11th invariant which, do, which will do even better. <coughs> and, and this does not require increasing data. It requires analysis of your data from different point of view. From point of view of your predicate. I will talk about this a little bit later when I will come to results. Sorry. 
this is explanation how to choose new invariant. Find situation box in the figure where existing model of the object approximation of our condition of probability contradict to reality, contradict to data from the box, and then modify the model to obtain new approximation that does not contain contradiction. And that is the same principle that physicists use. They have physical theory, and then it is most difficult part to find experiment which contradicts this physical theory. And this is exactly the same methodology. When we would like to, 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 to find some new information for data, we just looking in our data and trying to find examples, uh, situation where our data contradict our examples. So I would like to explain difference between features and variant. People sometimes asking, what is the difference between features and variants? With increasing number of features, one makes decision rule richer and richer. Increase VC dimension. You're just increasing VC dimension. And they, when you're increasing VC dimension, it requires more data. That is from classical VC theory. When you're increasing number of variant, you're decreasing VC dimension. With every invariant, you're removing from set functions which does not satisfy this invariant. And that means that you don't need to increase training data. You just will get better result because of your deep analysis of data. But I told that everything comes from mass. And how it comes, this invariant? We have Hilbert space. Hilbert space is extremely rich. In machine learning, we never use something richer than Hilbert space. But when you're looking at the Hilbert space, in Hilbert space, there is only two ways of convergence. One way of convergence called strong way of convergence. That's the first line, convergence in functions. And another way of convergence is convergence on, on functionals. What means functionals? Every phi of x means property, integral properties, property of your conditional probability function. And weak convergence requires convergence for all possible properties, for all functions. But what is intelligence? Intelligence is to choose finite number of invariants from possible infinite number of variants. And I will give you an example of what means with convergence. If, you, if it looks like a duck, swims like a duck, and quack like a duck, it is probably duck. That is exactly the idea of the convergence. Is integral characteristics look like a duck? If it seems like a duck, it is weak convergence. I hope you see. So, but what we're doing now, we use two hands. We use simultaneously weak convergence and strong convergence. It's like playing on the piano, not with one hand, but with two hands. So why we can have a better way to, to, to solve water recognition problem? And the very essential problem is intelligent student needs smart teacher? I don't know, but it's quite, quite possible that not. Because whatever I gave you, it was based on very trivial invariants. One of them was constant. Psi of x was constant, and another was x, just linear function. But you can imagine more deep properties of invariants. That is one of the deep properties, say, K nearest neighbors. For, for every point of training data, you have K nearest neighbor of the representative of the first class, and it will give you invariant from training in, in, in testing data, and it will give you whatever you want. But also, I don't want to talk about this. So using invariant you like that can do linear transformation. 
So all convolution neural net can be done with one in e equality. And that is the summary. What is computational method? So it is known that all possible functions can be described like the first formula. Then we see uh, the SVM, it is second formula. VSVM, it is short formula. But learning using statistical invariance, it is correction to all this stuff. And everything has closed form solution. There are no big problem, computational problems. So now I finished. Thank you. Yeah, this, uh, this might be kind of a stupid question, but what would be the strong uh, convergence for the dog example? I mean... <laughs> so, let me come to strong and weak convergence. The first line is strong convergence. The second line is weak convergence. But weak convergence requires the convergence for all possible properties, all function phi. Right. And there is a theorem which says that when you have strong convergence, you always have V convergence. It just proves one line. Yeah. It's Cauchy inequality. But if you're looking for strong convergence, so V convergence always exists. But if you are trying to identify ducks, right, do you have anything other than the weak convergence? You, you just need to know, look what it looks like, what so it sounds I, like. I, I told you that in Hilbert space, yeah. exist only two ways for convergence. There are no third way. Yeah. Okay. Right, you can use you. only weak or only strong or weak convergence. Okay. Thank there you. No another way from from deep mathematical point of view. So you cannot invent something else. It is ultimate. Okay. If you can, then you invent something number three in Gilbert space. Okay. Convergence different in, in Gilbert space. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so for the uh, for the weak convergence now if you replace the new with the probability measure so the Lebig integral will lead to some kind of uh, expected value of, of this equation no, no, just get back to the slide, the same slide. Not so fast. I, I try to understand what you're asking me, but let me show you. Oh. No, no, for the convergence, for the weak convergence. So weak convergence is... So now if you look at the weak convergence equation, you can see that if you replace mu with the probability measure, then this Lebig integral is going to be some kind of no, expected no, no. value. No, you have the same probability measure. You have function phi, which is true probability measure, and phi your approximation. So weak, uh, your approximation converge to, to, to true, to true condi uh, conditional probability function in weak mode if it converges for any function phi. That definition of weak convergence. So the mu is not uh, a measure in this case. You take any measure you want. Mm -hmm. uh, it is measure probability measure, which you, you you have probability measure of your problem. Use this probability measure. Yeah, that's my question. In case you replace the mu with the probability measure, then you're going to get you're going to have some kind of expected value. Then you will have a, a strong convergence. It is mathematical definition of uh, weak convergence, nothing to do with probability measure. It is just mathematical definition. But particular case is true for, for uh, statistical measure. Okay. It's more general than, than, than just statistics. It is from functional analysis come, 
from analysis of functions. When you have Hilbert space, in Hilbert space, you can talk about two ways of convergence. One of way which we usually using, it is strong convergence, but another way, it is way of properties, it is weak convergence. The my point was in this talk that we till now using just one way of convergence, which is not enough. And when we looking on the physicist, they don't have a lot of data, but they're looking for weak convergence. They're trying to create a situation which contradict existing theory, and we have to do the same. Okay, thank you. Is, for us, it is easy, because our nature is simple. It's just data, and we're looking for subset of data which contradict our general law. Thank you. So I'm just curious about like, um, what might be your comment on uh, the, rela the relationship between uh, like deep learning and the uh, more conventional machine learning methods, and how might the learning? I don't want to discuss it. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have no more uh, time for questions, but Vladimir is going to stay with us the entire day, so uh, we can take the rest of the questions offline. And we would also like. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah.